Good evening all, and welcome. Exploring abandoned places is certainly a fun thing to do, though it can be quite dangerous, and sometimes illegal. So, best be on your guard, and pick your battles cautiously. I'd also like to make you aware that History Profiles has released a new video on the legendary Chinese general Lu Bu, who some refer to as the Flying General. He has done a really interesting take on him, really good story and I highly recommend it. I'm going to leave a link in the description and at the end of the video for you to check it out. It would really mean a lot to me guys, thank you. But for now, it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. My name is Ozon, and I'm really big in the urbex scene, which is pretty uncommon in these parts. I also do a bit of graffiti. This is a big passion of mine, and I love every day of it. So we recently went to a cave called Tot. We were doing our usual looking around, getting a tour of the cave from one of the people who were usuals in it, taking pictures and looking for a place to chill. Keep in mind that there are many small tunes and split offs to get lost in, and a couple of kids actually started a fire because they got lost, and needed to keep warm. If you know anything about fire, it sucks in oxygen and makes carbon emissions. So they died because the oxygen in the cave that they needed to survive was all depleted. So they say that the cave is haunted by them. But there haven't been any reports of hauntings in a while. So once we got to the spot we were going to chill, we noticed that we had to climb a 40 foot vertical incline with sandstone carved into place to put your feet. Once you were at the top, it's pitch dark unless you have a flashlight in that direction. This is where things start to get creepy. When the new people start to shine their flashlight at this big hole next to the top of the chill spot, they start to ask me if I saw that or heard that. In my head, I started getting paranoid about the situation. So when we all start to get scared and creeped out, we walk out so nobody passes or has a panic attack. When we are about to leave, the older, more experienced cave dweller is last out to make sure no one is left behind. He was about to walk up to the entrance and he keeps tripping over nothing and then just started to cry. Side note, this guy's a big guy that never cries at all and he's bawling his eyes out from being paranoid. So I talk to him and just go slow and within a few minutes we're back in our cars. Our friend has stopped crying by now but starts to talk about how much his back hurt. So I told him to take his shirt off so that I could make sure he wasn't bleeding or anything. That's when I realized something strange. He had huge scratch marks across his back like he got scratched by a hand. His ankles had them too. So I thought that's when he kept tripping but realized that he was the last one out and no one was behind. So now that cave is extremely dangerous and people get the chills and have the same problem when they start to leave. That's the end of the time that I was most scared in a cave. There is an abandoned insane asylum in Northville, Michigan that my friends and I explored three times. This is the story of the third and final time we ever broke in. I still get chills every time I remember this night. The first two times we went, the asylum was actually more interesting than creepy to explore. Both times, we happened to run into very friendly people there. The first time we ran into another group of high school kids, scared the crap out of them at first, and the second time, we met a few stoner Vietnam vets that gave us a tour of the place. It's an entire complex, complete with underground tunnels, morgue, and a lot of files and things from the 50s. This time, however, we were alone. We only had two flashlights between three people, and much like the guy with the story about the World War II base, the echoing footsteps sound like they're coming from behind you, and always seem to take one more step after you stop. So after exploring much of the asylum like this, and being considerably creeped out already, we decided to head to the main building. It's about 18 stories tall, 
and the view from the top is pretty cool because it is by far the tallest building almost anywhere remotely close, and you can see Detroit from up there. Anyway, we're nearing the top of the seemingly endless stair corridor when the girl that's with us freezes and whispers for us to stop. I heard footsteps, she whispers. I tried to tell her it was just our footsteps echoing, but when both of them made me shut up and listen, I could hear it clear as day. The unmistakable sound of footsteps coming from the top floor. Now the building is tall, but very small area wise. So we were very close to the sounds. Still standing on the stairs, we whispered among us about what we were going to do. My very stupid friend insists that it's probably just another friendly person and that we should say hi. I try to explain to him that you don't just want to meet the kind of people that pace the top of the stairs of an old asylum in the middle of the night. We couldn't convince him and he goes to head up for the stairs. But I was like, forget this and just started running down the stairs. Fortunately, he followed us and we got out of there without ever finding out who or what was walking around there at night. To top it all off, a cop was passing by the road and spotted us after coming out the building and we had to run into the asylum complex to get away. I still think back to that night sometimes and wonder who was up there. There were definitely no guards, so it was probably either a gang, as there is gang graffiti all over the asylum, or the tortured soul of a crazy person. Either way, that was way too close. I live on an island with about 50 to 70 other residents. The island is about two to three miles long. This island is believed to be haunted. I've lived here for only two years and I've already got quite a few paranormal stories that I've either heard from longtime residents or experienced firsthand. So on one quarter of the island is the residential area with another quarter being abandoned buildings and the rest dense forest with a slim path down to the end. During October, me and a small group of friends decided to explore the abandoned buildings as a fun little spooky thing for the month of October. We grabbed our flashlights and headed off by foot now these weren't just normal abandoned buildings. These were abandoned from an old theme park from the 50s to 80s. A lot of them were very large and dark inside. As we approached the abandoned buildings, I got a very uneasy and creepy vibe that the forest was blocking a good amount of light and casting shadows everywhere on the buildings. First, we went into the little bumper car pavilion, which wasn't really scary besides the rotting inside the overgrowth. It was actually pretty cool until we heard a crash come from the old theater where the plays used to occur. Being the stupid boys we were, we decided to check it out. Every door seemed to be boarded up and blocked except for the one that was only blocked by a rock that two of us could easily move. We moved the rock and looked inside and turned on our flashlights to look in. And that's when we immediately got a fleeting sense of dread and helplessness. The theater itself was a mess with benches thrown around and tarps hanging from the roof, everything covered in a thick layer of dust. We began hearing strange noises, like a mix between humming and sobbing coming from a hall in the back. When we went back to the door, because we were super creeped out and just wanted to go and play games at this point, but on our way out, we took a look around and literally just as I was putting my foot out the door, I saw what looked like a giant humanoid thing, at least eight feet tall, completely black and shadow like, and it ran into the back hall. At this point, we were having none of it, booked it out the door to the main path and onto our golf cart and floored it back to the residential area. I thought it was all fine, but for a week after I saw it, I started to get headaches and vomiting, and at one point blacking out. Then it stopped, and the symptoms went away after a week. I checked with a doctor who said he didn't know what happened and that nothing was wrong with me. 
So I'm thinking, could it have been something paranormal from the shadow creature? Tell me what you think. In 2000, when I was just getting into exploring, the people I typically did things with were Quinn, a longtime buddy, Glenn, a friend of his, and Eugene, a teller of tall tales he tried to pass off as crazy reality, constantly learning magic from druids or being attacked by demons. Glenn knew of a creepy abandoned house so overgrown you could only spot it in one of three ways, walk up the front gate and look up the driveway, which had a canopy of trees overhead, making it like a tunnel, pull into a gravel area across the road when it was daytime, or there was a moon, and the very top was visible, or go down 30 yards down the street, where looking up diagonally, the peak of the roof and a side window showed through the trees. Glenn swore that at night, you could see something moving in said window. We all went out there, and yep, it certainly looked like a curtain blowing, but we were far away. Glenn brought one of those supposed million candle power auto spotlights, and with that shining on the window, which at that distance was about twice the size of a full moon, and pitch black as it lacked glass, there appeared to be a grey blob swaying from side to side. We left, got binoculars and came back. With the light off, there still appeared to be a blowing curtain even up close, with the lights on. The naked eye could see the blob swaying, but through the binoculars, it was just a dark square window. The front gate had a chain and padlock on it, as well as a no trespassing sign. At that time, we sometimes disobeyed those, so we got a master key, bolt cutters, and went out with flashlights to urbex the hell out of this big old dump. When we cut the chain, the house was painted white, it should be noted, briefly flashed white in the dark, and we chatted about that. Quinn thought it might be a magical ward keeping something in or out, being broken. The front yard was too overgrown to reach the front door, but we got in the back. The house was trashed, walls missing an old stove in the middle of the kitchen, junk and papers everywhere. I still have some of the religious homeschooling books we found, and on one corner of the living room floor, it was in the process of collapsing into the basement, with the ceiling following. The window we'd been looking at was about 10 feet above the landing, for the attic stairs, but there was a little platform with a railing. Upstairs had no wall or ceiling boards left, just framing, and not much besides an old rusty set of bed springs. We then went, into the basement, a happy land of ancient vegetables pickled in jars and old lawn care junk. In the basement, Eugene claimed to be attacked by a demon and ran out, but the house was singularly uncreepy once we were in the property. We considered it done and left. I know the date because I had a pet tag with our info made up to leave in there, but I forgot to do so and still have it, and it's dated the year 2000. Another anecdote about Eugene is that soon after this, he told us he returned to the house. In the attic, he found all the floorboards torn up and haphazardly nailed to the ceiling. In the second visit, that wasn't true. In 2005, a couple of guys who'd moved into the area wanted to try exploring, so we went there during the day. As we were standing at the gate, a van pulled up. The passenger, a woman, never looked or spoke to us. The driver, a middle-aged guy in a creepy, slightly teasing tone. You're not thinking of going in there, are you? I said, we're just looking. He said, it does say no trespassing. I asked if he was local and if he knew how we could contact the owners. He paused and then said in the same manner, that might be difficult. Then gave us what I thought was a really unsettling over large fake smile. He rolled up his window and drove away, and we left. Around 2010, I was telling some people who were visiting a mutual friend about it. We'd been talking about the supernatural and one said, I don't think I'm sensitive, but I tell people I am. I took them there that night. When we arrived, we aimed the car's headlights up the driveway. The guy got slammed with a wave of intense nausea. Again, we left. Not long after, 
Drew, a close friend who's not a believer in the slightest, drove up at night and there was a fresh shiny chain and padlock on the gate. We got out and looked up at the house. It was glowing reflecting the moonlight. We looked up. The sky was overcast and there was no moon and we left in a hurry. Drew and I also once saw freestanding walking shadow people when at another creepy house. I also think that his views on the paranormal may have changed after this incident. A month or two go by, and I met a guy through another friend who claimed to be a demon hunter. After we were talking about urban exploration, and I told the tale thus far of the house, he didn't know the area at all, and there were no other houses along for about two blocks, just trees and brambles. We were driving up, and as we barely reached the edge of what I'd call the property, before I had a chance to say anything he slammed on the gas. I asked why. He pointed left, and the house is on the left from that direction and said, something bad there. I don't know what it is, but it's really bad. He suggested having his team check it out. So I agreed to go along. At that time, the friend I trusted most was Ash. So I called her and she agreed to go too. Ash claimed to be able to sense things, but I know little about that. I do know that I always feel safe with her and I've revisited a few places that unnerved me and felt fine with her present. The night before I had a really unusual dream in which I met what I thought might be some sort of spirit guide or guardian angel. This will be relevant shortly. We all arrive and park in the gravel area across the street. I show them the shiny new chain and lock and the driveway looks too overgrown to go through. The leader of the team talks with me about the place and I give her the whole history. She has a cocky, arrogant attitude that bugs me. So just to see what she'd say, I ask if she can interpret dreams. She says yes. So I describe one from the previous night. She says, oh yes, that was me contacting you to request your guidance in going through this house and fighting these demons. My BS meter promptly went through the charts, but I didn't say it. We looked up at the attic window from down the street and all saw the breezy curtain thing. Ash is on her way, and while I wait, the others shove their way into the bushes at the far end of the yard versus the driveway, hoping to find a path. The guys come out and said they found a back way in. They all go, and I wait for Ash. She gets here and I give her the lowdown. She agrees these guys sound like they're full of hot air and I call one of the guys and he climbs out to show us the way in. It's a rough method, but enters the far end of the front yard past a greenhouse, which someone had left a bunch of chemicals in. Looks like they might've been trying to make something bad. And up the front porch. On this visit, the front door was accessible, but the back and basement doors weren't. Not much had changed in the house and the living room corner was in the same state of semi-collapse. The team went around just basically exploring while the leader sat around and pontificated at us about her abilities. This time, I brought a camera. Though I lost the photos a few years ago in a hard drive failure, at this point she told me she's a magnet for spirits and that if I snapped a photo of her sitting on the attic stairs, there would be things around her. When I got home and looked at the photos as I expected, there was nothing even remotely ghostly with her in any of the pictures. Ash said she could feel something there lightly, but that this demon hunting team was just a bunch of bumblers trying to poke stuff with a sharp stick. I agreed. Absolutely nothing that seemed paranormal happened, though she said she got rid of them. A few years after this, the house was demolished and the debris removed. The gate with the chain and lock and no trespassing sign is still there though, and all the surrounding bush and trees are intact. I'm an urban explorer, but nearly everything I've done has been above ground. But there was an old farmhouse near me that's now been demolished, which I explored several times, including the basement. Let me tell you, I'd say the times something unexplainable happened were about under 5%, but I have had several within this house. 
It had been abandoned for at least 30 years, was in very poor shape, and used to be a big party spot for teens. A friend can recall waking up on the lawn one morning still drunk surrounded by empty bottles. The basement had a bunch of usual bull laughable, wannabe satanic tagging all across one wall in red paint, and religious messages in black countering it, on the opposite wall. The underground experience happened one night, as the three of us were walking up the staircase out of the basement, which had solid walls on both sides. As we did, each person in turn from top down got their shoulders bumped, as though a person were going down past us as we were going up. I might as well mention the non-underground ones too, in case someone is interested. The second floor ceiling was damaged, but we did go up the attic stairs, and when we shone a light towards the other end, we saw what appeared to be a human face, and only a face down there, completely not moving. The windows were all boarded over, but one on the second floor had the board nailed over at the top. It was bent open outwards at the lower end, held out by a chunk of wood. On one visit with some newbies, we looked up and saw that it was closed. The newbies thought the place looked to be run down, but safe. And when they tried to uncover a statue among the weeds in the yard, they elected to poke around in there. When the rest of us got upstairs, the board was bent open as usual. And when we looked out and saw the others in the yard, and I'm still kicking myself for not shouting down to them, because when we got back inside, it was shut again. This all happened back in the 90s. I'd say 96 or 7. I was around 14. I had this close friend called Kyle. He was like a big brother to me, sometimes playful, sometimes a bully. As most of the boys who grew up in the 90s, we spent all of our free time playing video games, watching cheesy horror flicks, and roaming the neighborhood on our bicross bicycles, all stickered up like motorbikes. Once in a while, my mother would take us up to my grands. They lived in the countryside just outside of town. After having our meal, we'd usually gear up, grab some snacks and juice, and jump on our bikes to go to the lake. To do this, we had to ride till the end of the bumpy road, then go through a sunflower field. The lake was downhill from there. Now every time we'd cross that field, a building in the far would intrigue us. It appeared abandoned. It was a typical factory built in the 80s. We could see lots of windows were jammed, some parts of the roof had holes, and the sun was beaming from it. I swear we came across this place 30 times at least. We'd come closer and play dare, and I always ended up being chicken, as Carl really wanted to get in there. And one day, I dared. We parked the bikes against a wooden fence, and then started trespassing. Outside the building were dozens of rusty cars, engines out, some seats put on the floor and others burnt or mauled. The entrance was poorly barricaded, but enough to make us climb up a pipe to the first window we saw. The inside was shocking. It looks like people stopped all they were doing to rush out. Tools were disposed on workshops, a car was hung up by a huge chain, and it was still slightly moving. The only thing that yelled abandoned was the tremendous amount of dirt and dust. I still remember Carl found an iron pole and started swinging it like he was a video game character. I knew him. Even if he played it cool, I felt he was scared and was just trying to act tough. We headed to what seemed to be the administrative aisle. I was upstairs. We had to take some thin iron stairs, threatening to detach from the stairs on every breath. The gloom intensified. This place was basically a long hallway with offices all along. Again, it could have just been functional the week before, because except the dust, all was smelly and stuffy and everything was left untouched. In a room, we found a newspaper from 1984. It made us compute that they bailed out this year. What impressed me the most was the family pictures in the frames that we found in some offices. 
That was creepy. Who would leave work forever without taking back the pictures of your kids? At this time, a picture meant something. Smartphones didn't exist. So if you lost it, it was done. When we went back to the stairs, Carl saw a small wooden door under the staircase. It led to the basement. That place looked inhabited. The floor was covered with trash, feces and smelt like fresh urine. In a corner, we found an actively decaying corpse of a cat. A green curtain was hanging and masked what we were about to see. Behind the curtain, we stared in awe in front of a man laying on the floor. He was gibbering words we didn't understand and didn't directly look at us. Another man was facing the wall. Although it was clear we were there, I even stumbled on an empty can, he still remained facing the wall. To this day, I don't know what he was doing. Now it was clear the guy laying was drooling and had his eyes injected red. We ran the hell out of there. I recall jumping on my bike and seeing a silhouette behind a window on the first floor. We never told this story to our parents. We were too afraid to be grounded. Last year, I chatted with Carl on social media. We hadn't seen each other for 15 years, and I asked him if he remembered that day. He told me, of course, I was crapping my pants, dude. I didn't want to go in there at all, and I never thought you would say, dare. Earlier this year, I went to a local Sheets, a gas station here on the East Coast. Specifically, I live in North Carolina. I was with my dad getting some food when we saw an old abandoned house sort of tucked back into the woods behind the store. Us both being urban explorers, we parked and went carefully up to the house. The house wasn't deep in the woods and the woods weren't that thick, so we were in pretty easy. It was just your standard trashed abandoned house. Nothing too out of the ordinary. It was behind the house where the point of interest was. My dad was about to turn and leave when I went around the back. A few yards away from the house was a shed, behind which was a tent. I went to look at the shed, which had a baby doll hanging from a noose with a lay around it. When I got close enough to see the tent, it was very clearly abandoned. For quite a while, it seemed. There were sterno stoves and a lot of household stuff around the Bibles and other books and shoes and purses. It was obviously a homeless woman who had camped there, going to the Walgreens in Sheets, very close by. I had to leave my dad, and I was already running a little late for other things, but came back and investigated further. What I found was very interesting. There was a notebook in the tent, slightly water damaged, but I was still able to make it out for the most part. The name in the journal was June Ann Castles and had a ledger of purchases made. Small things, toothpaste, gas for the stove, small amounts of food, and the last listed purchase was $2,000, car. That really was all I found significant at the camp. I went home and spoke with my dad about it. We looked online for a June Castles to see what we could find, things like Facebook pages and social media, and all that we found was an obituary. June Ann Castles died at the age of 58, Raleigh, North Carolina. It listed the date and time of death, but nothing else. It was a very loose ends kind of obituary. We found it interesting and spoke a little bit about it, but nothing ever came of it really. They just recently leveled that little bit of land, house and camp. Last night I was working third shift. I had recently picked up a job at a different sheet station working overnight. This is just literally down the road from the one me and my dad were at, where the camp was set up. And the first to say spooky paranormal things don't really happen on third shift, at least not in my job. Mostly gotta watch out for extremely high or drunk people, but that's it. But last night made me doubt it a little. It was 3am, when I was outside collecting trash from the outside cans, across the parking lot, and then I see a lady walk out of the woods very slowly. She was walking towards the back customer entrance of our store. I saw she was, and I knew the other two employees were busy with other things. So I walked in to ring her up. When she got closer, I saw she was horribly thin. 
I mean, I could see her skull. Her hands looked like bones that would have fallen apart if there was even a little bit of skin holding them in place. She was 60 to 70, but she was so ragged and battered it was hard to tell. She handed me a bag of classic Lay's chips and two quarters. It wasn't enough to pay for it. So I handed her the change back and said, it's okay, go ahead and take it, offering her some free food as well. She looked honestly like she hadn't eaten in months. She never looked at me, just took the chips and the quarters and turned around, then took two steps, slowly turned around back towards me and looked directly at me. She spoke and said this, I live in a tent in the woods over there. She pointed in the direction of the old campsite and turned back around. Her whole body was frail and shaking and she walked away as slowly as she came in. I watched her walk back into the woods going in the same direction. Could you guys give me your opinion on this? I don't know where I stand, but nobody else saw her. And the more I think about it, the less I understand. This happened when I was 12. My friends and I used to ride our bikes all over Hell Half's Acre. We lived in a neighborhood bordering East Cleveland that got a lot of spillover crime from the ghetto, most of which were high school age kids in gangs committing senseless crimes, robberies, the ending of lives. I even had one friend whose mother was in the wrong place at the wrong time and her life was tragically cut short by a stray bullet. I guess our town wasn't the best neighborhood, but it wasn't the worst either. I had saved up money from my birthdays and holidays and saved up enough to buy a new mountain bike. And it was pretty badass, although I believe it was only about $200. But it was the first thing that I ever saved my money for and bought for myself. Naturally, I wanted to take it into the woods to rip some trails and being in an urban environment, all we had nearby was some small patches of wood. A few years prior to this, I ran away from home and got lost for four hours before stopping at a gas station and calling my dad who was the reason I ran away from home in the first place to come and get me. The reason I got lost is because I turned off the road behind the local post office and went through a pretty big wooded lot, the biggest I'd seen in the area. And when I came out, I was not anywhere I recognized. I called up my friend who also has a mountain bike and told him about the wood lot. We decided to go rip the trails. When we arrived at the post office, the scene was pretty much the same, except they'd fenced this off with an eight foot fence and barbed wire. Not the looping razor wire that's impossible to climb that you see in prisons and military compounds. And luckily, there was a small cut in the fence that we could sneak through with the bikes without having to challenge the barbed wire. Although our urban exploration had brought us over many barbed wire fences, so we were used to getting over them unscathed, but never with bikes. So we snuck into the wooded lot and got on our bikes and headed down the trail, which was on a downhill decline. As we just started to pick up speed, we were not even 50 yards into the lot when we saw ahead of us, probably another 50 feet, a group of eight to 10 older kids, all tattered up and not dressed like they were there for camping. They were in baggy clothes and jeans in summertime and they were just standing around a fire smoking cigarettes or something. We stopped and looked at them for what seemed like a few seconds, and they noticed us immediately. At first they started yelling at us to come over, but neither of us moved. We were both good kids with good families and we knew that this was not a situation we wanted to be in. They began getting more aggressive as we didn't respond. And the, hey, come over here, turned into, I said get over here now. At this point, my friend and I looked at one another, knowing they wanted to steal our bikes and probably beat us up, hoping one of us had some kind of escape plan. When I looked back to see what they were doing, we saw two of them running at us. We flipped our bikes around and took off back towards the fence. We were pedaling uphill, so we were going slower than we would have if we were on foot. I was in front and jumped off my bike and ran with it in tow beside me and my friend followed suit and did the same. We were covering ground faster on foot since we were going uphill and couldn't gain any momentum. We get to the top and we're greeted by the barbed wire fence. 
crap. Now I was a pretty strong 12 year old, very athletic, and had a natural strength from growing up as a wrestler. We wasted no time looking for the opening because it's well hidden and a pain in the ass to get through. So I grabbed my bike and threw it over the fence. My brand new bike. Then I grabbed my friend's bike and did the same. We scaled the barbed wire and jumped down from the top and into the parking lot where our bikes lay astrew. And hurriedly picked them up, scaling the barbed wire fence had brought us some time because the other two guys behind us were holding the fence open for each other and one guy got his shirt snagged. We took off as fast as we could and now we're on smooth pavement and a flat landscape. There's no way we're getting caught by someone on foot. We spread off a mile or so down the road and stopped at a gas station, scared out of our wits and gasping for breath. We looked back and saw no one, or so we thought. As we sat there in the parking lot of the gas station, recapping what had just taken place, we were getting ready to ride away when our worst nightmare unfolded. An old body style grand marquise pulled up and in it were four of the eight or 10 guys we saw. I'm not certain where the others were, but two of them were unmistakably the guys chasing us in the woods, and the others were probably down in the woods, but I didn't recognize them. My relief of escape turned to terror as the car pulled in and one of the guys jumped out. Hey, you. We didn't wait around to hear the rest. We hit skates and were cutting away on our bikes before they could respond, pedaling as fast as our legs could take us. They got in the car and followed us through the neighborhood as we cut through backyards and threw our bikes over fences, cut across streets and ran for our lives. We eventually found our way into the backyard of someone a couple of blocks from my house that lived on a corner and had a large wooden privacy fence, which we hid behind. We could still see through the small cracks between the wooden planks and had a view of the street from two different angles. We saw the car pass twice, but then nothing. But we didn't want to risk coming out quite yet. What if they were waiting up the street? What if they were waiting down the street? We didn't know what to do. Then the luckiest thing happened. The guy whose yard we were hiding in called the police. We saw the flashing lights through the fence posts and panicked. We thought we were going to be arrested, but the cops weren't concerned with what we were doing as much as they were concerned with who we were hiding from. We recapped the story and they gave us rides to our house. It was over. The cops never did find those guys, what they were doing or what they wanted. I can only imagine that they wanted our bikes or that they just wanted to beat us up for fun. Maybe both. I moved out the area three years later and my friend stayed. He's currently serving jail time for a gang related crime. 14 years later, as a 26 year old, six foot, 225 pound guy, I still have frequent nightmares at least once a month, where I'm on foot or on a bike, running through my old neighborhood while being chased by gangsters who want to end me. This was probably the most terrifying experience of my life. This might be the strangest and most terrifying thing I've ever experienced while doing urban exploration. We were in the abandoned metro of Rochester, New York, filming a documentary on it. At one point, we heard a voice echoing through the concrete corridor. At first, it sounded like a woman calling for a friend, but what she was saying was unintelligible. We assumed she was calling out for a friend, so we kept walking. Heard nothing for a few seconds, but then it started up again. This time, it sounded closer and strange, still nonsense, but no longer like she was calling for a friend, more like she was yelling at someone, us perhaps. Then a light appeared from one of the pillars. As soon as we turned ours off, the light was gone. There was no voice after that, no light or sound at all. The sound of someone running or walking away or anything. We didn't think much of it at the time, but things get stranger while I was editing the video. So the light appeared relatively close to us, maybe 100 or 150 meters away. This was close to an open manhole cover that led to an old brick sewer that we found. It looked like it was recently open. And although we didn't entertain the notion at the time, this woman may have gone down there after we spooked her. 
It is also possible that she hid and waited for us to leave, or was following us. I had a feeling that we were being watched, and kept checking behind me the whole time we were down there. That doesn't prove that she was following us, but it is certainly odd. I've been to abandoned hospitals and high schools and rarely have I ever had this feeling. After the documentary was uploaded, a few people I know tried to decipher what she was saying, but it sounded like nonsense. I don't think this was anything paranormal, but the whole thing is just weird. Like, if it's just a squatter or homeless person, would we know? Would we have heard them running or hiding? Or would they have tried to scare us away? It's a very odd experience, and I'd appreciate any input. Every day while I was in elementary school, I always passed by this gigantic moldy house. It was black and decaying and smelt awful. My friends and I decided to go inside through the back. We broke the wooden door with our feet. It was loud enough that the teachers heard, but they didn't care. Before we got in, we examined the back. Every step felt like the floor beneath us was falling. Though we knew it was just dirt, and that's what that does. We eventually got bored and started stomping on the dirt. We stomped too hard, and it broke. And we saw what we thought was a skull, and got scared. So being the dumb kids we were, we walked away, but went into the house. It was the backyard leading to the kitchen. The kitchen was moldy, dirty, and full of black stuff on the floor. Not mold, but like a puddle that wasn't water either. The house smelt so, so bad. We walked into the living room and there was a mannequin just sitting there on the decaying sofa staring at the wall. It freaked me out, but fascinated my friends. The floor had tons of stuff on it. Broken glass, wood, decaying floor and stuff. Typical abandoned house things. We went up and explored a bit. And when we went into the bathroom, the same old dead body smell. The curtains for the bathtub were closed and there was no way in hell we were gonna open them. We were stupid, but not that stupid. There was a trail of black leading to the bathroom and into the bathtub. We didn't pay mind to it. But we did see it. One of the girls in my group decided to go to the attic, so she saw many old dolls and stuff, like the China dolls from the 1880s and stuff, but they were all scribbled and had writing on their face. We didn't automatically assume it was demonic. Why would we? And didn't really know much about that, much less about the writing. She came down and left everything the same. We were exploring a bit, then we came back down to the mannequin. We heard some noises earlier, and the mannequin wasn't there anymore. It was scary, but we tried not to pay it much mind. We walked past the basement, and we were dumb, but not that dumb, and didn't go down. But we saw something standing at the door of the basement. That's when we wanted to leave. It was about six to seven feet tall and looked like the mannequin from earlier, but we were too afraid to even notice the mannequin had moved from the spot. We stared back at it. When we noticed it had the same black trail from the bathtub, and the bathtub's curtains were on it. We assumed this wasn't a mannequin and at this point ran as fast as we could from whatever that thing was back to school. Even if we hadn't been dismissed an hour ago, the teachers were still there in the late pickup rooms. We told the teachers and we sat there like a couple of ghosts. I had the tannest skin and was basically pale. We were scared, but we got out of there alive, so that's okay. About a year or so later, they completely blocked off the backyard and changed a lock and a wooden door together with a huge lock. They boarded up windows tightly as well as the basement somehow. But it's just scary and it freaks me out to this day. I walk past that house every day to school and just keep thinking of the time. And I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't have run so fast. That will always creep me out. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed Urban Exploration Stories for today. I always get a kick out of these. I really like them because something interesting and unexpected always happens, at least in my opinion. If you enjoyed this video, well, I don't need to tell you what to do. You already know, so just do it. Thanks, guys. 
Huge thanks as always to my amazing patrons and members whose names you can see on screen. You get loads of perks for being a member and or a patron. You know, if you're both, that's like super cool. Stickers, emojis, cool stuff. And the more members we get, the more stickers we can make. So, you know, if you want fancy stickers and more of them, feel free to join. But as I said at the start, my brother has released a really fascinating and interesting video on Lubu. I highly suggest it. It's really, really good. Uh, it's just generally a really awesome channel. All right then guys, I'm gonna leave you here with Lubu on screen now. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.